All right, welcome everyone. Um, it's great to have you joining us for this lunch free lunch hour live stream. And if you are actively watching this, if you want to um, let me know in chat, I would love that. Uh, and any like thing that's going on for you right now. So if you're actively fasting or if you just broke a fast or there's something kind of on your mind about fasting that you've got questions about, I'd love to hear all of those. Let me take down this little banner here. Hmm. Stop sharing. There we go. Perfect. Um, so it is awesome to be here with you. And let's see. There we go. Okay, cool. Hopefully I fixed it now. Um, there's a bit of a delay, so I think maybe, hopefully it's better. Um, and I have some fun things to share with you today. So I was thinking about talking about some of my favorite books around intermittent fasting. Um, and if there's other topics you guys would like to talk about too, I'm happy to do that. Happy to um, dive into some of those, but I figured this would at least give us something to kind of start with. And perfect, thank you, good to know. Um, so, all right, let's see. Doop, doop, doop. All right, I'm gonna start off with, okay, so a little bit of background. So I think it's really interesting to kind of look at the history of fasting. And I've actually done a whole video series just on this. The first one came out last week, the next one's coming out this weekend, and then we'll do one more after that. So it's a three-part series on the history of fasting. But, you know, it's really interesting because the literature on fasting, I think, reflects kind of the trends and what has happened with fasting over time. So um, in the early 1900s, there were a number of books published on intermittent fasting. So there was like The Fasting Cure, there was one of Dewey's books, there was a um, book called, uh, oh gosh, Fasting, Vitality, and Nutrition. Um, there are a whole bunch that kind of came out right around like 1905, 1908, 1911, that kind of time period. And then there weren't a lot that came out. There was like one or two in there, but not a lot of fasting books came out until about 2002. And in 2002, Ori Hofmeckler came out with the Warrior Diet book, which sort of started this whole new wave looking at intermittent fasting. Um, and starting in about 2015, you see like the Potato Fast come out, 2016, I think Jen Stevens' first book comes out, The Complete Guide to Fasting comes out with Dr. Jason Fong. Um, and there's like a number of books that start coming out, kind of rapid fire. And now when you look at it, like everybody's coming out with an intermittent fasting book. It's just wild. Um, and I think it speaks to how far we've come with all of this, but also, um, and I'm getting some error messages about bit rate. So hopefully, let me know if you're having trouble viewing this. Um, it's so funny. It jumps between excellent and bad. Excellent, bad. I don't know what's going on. Um, but hopefully it's okay. I'll keep going. Let me know if it's not. Um, and yeah, so we see this whole series of books kind of come out just in the last, uh, you know, five to ten years that really are riding this huge interest in intermittent fasting and I think a lot of it comes from the research that's being done on intermittent fasting and and how this is all just um you know such a hot area of science right now um so you have you know Dr. Verde you've got Walter Longo and um Mark Matson, Rhonda Patrick like tons of people that are really doing either research or speaking to the powerful research that's being done around intermittent fasting. And so I think that's really led to this huge sort of wave of, of interest. But um, yeah, you know, it's very modern. I think that's really important to know that this is something that is just kind of coming up in popularity again and for really good reason. You know, the, the difference between a fad and a trend, I think is important to understand. 
in a fad I think of as being like beanie babies, like something where you just get this incredible interest in it, people go nuts for it, and then it really tapers off because at the end of the day, you can't really sustain um, <laughs> this kind of obsessiveness about beanie babies or Furbies or you know things like that, um, or even just like a particular diet that doesn't really um, have a lot of merit, you know, isn't really grounded in science, like cabbage soup diet or something like that, right? And then on the other side, you have things that are trends, things that are like actually have real staying power that can, um, that, you know, in the case of something like intermittent fasting are actually based on hard science and really do work in our bodies. And I think that that is so much more powerful and so much more interesting than a lot of the fads because you know this actually works. This isn't just some influencer tweeted about it and everyone's now going nuts about it. It's something where you know the the foundation is really solid and that this is just something that we've forgotten and we've lost. And so I, I think it, anyway, I, I, you know, just, just sort of an interesting thing to, to note, the difference between a fad and really a trend. Um, and things that you know you can think of as trends are like people moving away from soda to drinking water, or um, people choosing to get away from supersizing foods and and moving towards smaller portions. Like things like that are more trends than fads. Um, and I think intermittent fasting is absolutely a trend, not a fad. So. You know, since 2016, and I just Googled this morning out of curiosity, well, really, I went on Amazon and did a book search for intermittent fasting books. And if you can believe it, there are now 10,000 results that will come in. And obviously, not all of these books are created equal. I think it's really important to consider the source when you look at where you should be getting your, your literature from and your information. And so all of the books that I'm going to mention on the call today are from people who are either physicians, researchers, or someone that I believe is truly an expert in the space and not just sort of making shit up to sell books. Um, there's somebody that's either worked with a lot of fasters or has like really extensive knowledge in the field. Um, and some of the books that I thought we could talk about today are those that are really good for the, for people who are new and looking for a good, easy introduction to intermittent fasting. So one of my absolute favorite books in this space, um, and I will mention several of their books throughout this um, because I do think that they are just such a great source of information, particularly if you are getting into intermittent fasting for weight loss um, or for reversing type 2 diabetes. That's really their area of expertise. Um, but Dr. Jason Fung, Megan Ramos, and in the case with Eve Mayer on this book, um, Life in the Fasting Lane, I think is probably the best book for people who are brand new to this that just want an easy, light introduction to intermittent fasting and why it is so different than other things that are out there um, in the wellness space. And so I can read you a little bit from the summary, the publisher summary on this. Let's see. Um, Okay, perfect. Since they're talking about fads, I'll, since I was talking about fads, they're talking about fads. While some in the medical community initially dismissed the idea of intermittent fasting as a dangerous fad, recent research not only validates the safety of fasting for weight loss, but also offers compelling evidence of wide ranging health benefits from the reversal of diabetes and other metabolic disorders to enhanced cognitive function and increased longevity longevity, but for many who are eager to try out fasting, the, reg the regimen can feel a bit intimidating. After all, abstaining from food doesn't sound like much fun. People rightly wonder, how often can I eat? How will I be able to focus at work? Will I have enough energy to exercise? And perhaps the most concerning question of all, won't I be hungry all the time? Um, so anyway, it goes on to explain more about the book, but I think that that is just a really good one for people who are brand new to this, who are interested in trying it, who, um, you know, are like not that interested in the hard science, don't really want to go super deep, but want to hear like a lot of personal stories, a lot of illustrations with real patients, um, and just really get sort of the basics of things. 
Um, other books that I think are good in that space. So The Fast Diet by uh, Michael Mosley and Mimi Spencer. That one could be a good introduction, though that's definitely a steeper climb because they're talking about really doing like a 5-2 fasting plan, which means two days of the week you're eating less than 500 calories. Um, so that can be an intense one, but also a nice, good, easy primer to kind of get you started. Um, Jen Stevens has several that I think are, are good, nice, light reads that you know do a nice job of educating people on kind of the basics of fasting without getting too deep um, into the hard, hard science, um, but are still grounded in that. So um, the one I think I liked the best was Delay, Don't Deny for Beginners. Um, and it's the subtitle is Living an Intermittent Fasting Lifestyle. And that one talks about, you know, tired of calorie counting, eliminating foods from your diets, or obsessing about all food, <laughs> about food all day. If so, intermittent fasting lifestyle might be for you. This book, in this book, you will learn the science behind intermittent fasting and also understand how to adjust the various intermittent fasting plans to work for your unique lifestyle. Um, so yeah, and it kind of goes on from there. Um, and I do really like that concept of delay, don't deny. I think that can be really powerful for people. Um, let's see if there's any good quotes I'll highlight. Yeah, our hunger hormones are on overdrive because we have tried unsuccessfully to restrict what we are eating and we are eating processed junk. Agree with that. Um, yeah, feel free to drop questions in chat about books because that's the topic today, talking all about favorite fasting books. Um, another one I'll mention, The Complete Guide to Fasting, Heal Your Body Through Intermittent, Alternate Day, and Extended Fasting, is a great one for people who are newer to fasting, but maybe want a little bit more of a comprehensive guide. So again, it's Dr. Jason Fung. Um, this one he wrote with Jimmy Moore, who's been getting into some trouble recently. Um, and yeah. So maybe you choose the other one, but um, just in case you're interested in this one, this was one of the first books that I could find that was really comprehensive. You know, when I first started getting into fasting, I must have gotten into fasting probably back in 20, uh, maybe 2015 or so. Um, and so what's that, seven years ago now? That's crazy. And this book had not even come out yet. And so I was really scrounging for, and I did not come across the warrior diet until much later. So really I found the potato fast and I found some of the really old literature on fasting, um, but it was hard to find like a really comprehensive, good book. And this was the first one that I found. Um, yeah, so anyway, that's that one. Um, why we get fat and what to do about it, Gary Tobes. This book I had found probably in 2013, and this one I absolutely love. If you are not familiar with the concept of um, sugar and refined carbohydrates and processed foods, I think it, you know, I, I think it's a bit dated, um, but it really simplifies. And his hypothesis, which I think is partially correct, um, but at the time it was like game-changing for me. I thought it was so powerful at the time. Um, he says, and I'm going to quote, the simple answer as to why we get fat is that carbohydrates make us so. Protein and fat do not. I think that's a little bit of an oversimplification. I think there really are a lot of good carbohydrates that we need, um, but certainly in the case of sugar and uh, processed carbohydrates, I think that's absolutely true. Um, there also might be more complexity to it, like I think niacin might play a role in it um, and some other things based on the work of, oh gosh, I'm blanking on his name, but um, he wrote Mark something, Mark, oh my gosh, um, he wrote The End of Craving and The Dorito Effect. I think both of those have some really interesting insights, um, but anyway, um, because I just have such an affinity for that book and it helps a lot in terms of, of learning a lot of the basics of kind of what was going on in my own body that will always always be on my list um, and then actually probably getting into some of the more complex the science heavy books oh, yeah, actually let me check questions first okay no questions so far please write in questions if you've got them um, let's see 
Let me go back here for a sec. So the Intermittent Fasting Revolution. Um, this book by Mark Matson is fantastic. I haven't even finished reading it yet, and I'm already putting it on my list because, number one, Mark Matson is just such a powerhouse. Um, I believe he's a neuroscientist at Johns Hopkins. He has done a lot of research personally on intermittent fasting, and he led to a lot of the work that was done by Mike Mosley and others um, in really kind of educating people on how powerful fasting is for longevity, for brain health, um, and for a lot of the benefits that go well beyond weight loss. Um, and he even talks about like gut microbiome and how that heals through intermittent fasting. So he just has some fantastic, really, really well-researched, grounded in science um, facts in here. And some, some really great quotes in the book that I just like keep using because I just think they're so, they're so powerful. Um, so he's probably my favorite of the heavy science books. Um, yeah. So let's see. The Fasting Cure by Upton Sinclair. Um, I think it's a really cool one if you are interested in the history of fasting and what was known around the turn of the century. It's also really good if you're interested in extended fasting. It talks more about extended fasting. Now granted it's all anecdotal, um, but there's something like 200 some odd people who participated in extended fasts that Upton Sinclair refers to throughout his book and shares findings of. Um, and that's also true of the Nutrition, Vitality, and Health um, book. Uh, I think this is the right one. Mm, I gotta double check. Um, but there's Vitality, Nutrition, Vitality, no, this isn't the right book. Okay, sorry, I have the wrong one. Um, it's Vitality, fasting and nutrition or something. I'll have to find it again. Um, but it was written, so if, let's see, Upton Sinclair wrote, I want to say in like, yeah, he wrote in 1911. So the other one was written in 1908. And they both have a lot of really interesting sort of anecdotal examples um, and their own personal experiences with long fasts, like talking 10 plus day fasts. Um, one of the concepts that they talk about that I've only seen in these ancient books and don't seem to really make an appearance in the more modern ones is this idea of what they call a complete fast, where you basically start fasting and then you don't resume eating until your body is what's really telling you, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, it's time to eat. Um, and that's just not a concept you see in modern fasting books. So really interesting. No idea if there's a scientific basis for it, um, but certainly interesting to learn more about. And hunger and unnatural history is um, another one that I think is actually has some really interesting insights into fasting. This is not one people talk about often. Um, again, it's sort of in the classical stuff. I'll have to see what year this one was written because um, I don't know off the top of my head. But um, they look at, you know, one of the most interesting stories that I think was featured in this book, if I'm remembering correctly, is the story of. Um, a physician who, and I want to say this was maybe like, ugh, I'm not going to get the date right, but I want to say it was like maybe 1930s, um, who decided that he was just so miserable and so unhappy in his life and in a lot of pain and just not in a good, good place, very depressed, that he was going to fast and really fast point past the point of fasting, but starve himself until he passed away from it. He decided that like, that was what he was gonna do. And instead, um, what happened was he started to basically heal, probably his gut microbiome, certainly a lot of his mental health things. Um, and you know, obviously this has not been, this is just an anecdotal, um, you know, one person's example, but um, not necessarily something that will work uniformly is what I'm trying to say. Like definitely don't try this at home. But he started fasting and basically felt so amazing, healed everything that was going on with him to the point where he decided he wanted to live and he wanted to help other patients do this. And so really cool story, um, really interesting history there. Yeah, cool. All right, so that's several of them. Um, I can do more of these in the future. So I won't necessarily steal all the time to, to talk just about uh, books on fasting. So please feel free, drop questions in chat and I will answer some of those. Um, and I think, you know, one of the questions that came up this week was 
during one of our live calls was like, what is my absolute favorite fasting book? And it's such a tough one to answer. And you have to know that I'm a big nerd. I like geek out on this stuff. So I love them all. Um, but right now I am so hot on this intermittent fasting revolution book. I just think it pulls in more of the science than anything else that's out there. Um, partly because it just came out in 2022. So there is more science to draw from. Um, and because I just have such tremendous respect for Mark Matson. So anyway, that's my personal favorite one. Um, yeah, cool. All right. Nobody's very talkative today. Hmm. <laughs> um, well, please do write questions in chat and I will come get those. If that's the case, then I will keep going with some of these books. Maybe that's what you want. You want to just hear more about the books. So um, another one that I really love, and I've actually met, um, he did a live Q&A with us, Dr. Jay Richards, I think really highly of this book and um, just the research and the time he put into uh, the book called Eat, Fast, Feast. Heal Your Body While Fe Feeding Your Soul. A Christian Guide to Fasting. And, you know, there was a lot I really liked about this book. Um, it's interesting because he does, does a good job of balancing kind of hard fact and science and nutrition with spirituality, Christian theology, um, and, and history and sort of weaving the two together. And he um, has some amazing quotes in it. Like, I, uh, I wish I had I should have pulled it beforehand, but like one of them is something along the lines of, um, oh, I'm going to butcher it, but he basically says that he doesn't think it's a coincidence that Christianity, um, like the Christian church, not necessarily, you know, the beliefs, but um, the church in recent years has been losing members and kind of becoming um, much less a part of our society. And he believes that that is not a coincidence given the fact that they have lost touch with their fasting tradition and that other religions like Islam that have done a much better job of maintaining their fasting tradition have um, also similarly sort of maintained more of that devout, uh, devout following. And so he talks about that in his book, which I think is just such an interesting um, observation and, and kind of hypothesis. And yeah, some of the things that I learned from this one that I just thought were so interesting were that Christians like a thousand years ago were routinely fasting two days a week, probably minimum, during Lent more. And they celebrated things like Advent and Ember days through fasting, as well as a lot of saint days with fasting. And pretty much all of that has fallen away from the Christian church. Um, and, you know, generally the, in Orthodox, like Greek Orthodox or other, you know, um, sects, there are some, uh, some that definitely maintain that. But I think it's just really interesting to see how, um, how much our society has kind of, or our Christian society has gotten away from um, making fasting part of that tradition. And just full disclosure, I was raised Catholic, though I don't necessarily really identify as that anymore. Um, like I don't frequently go to church or things like that, but I do find myself being very spiritual. And um, I know that, uh, you know, I, I know a lot of, I, I went to Catholic Sacred Heart High School. I did, you know, CCD all through. So I do very much, probably of any religion, I understand Christianity, more about Christianity than, than any other. Um, so anyway, little disclosure on that. <laughs> um, now, in terms of Buddhism, there's a really interesting book that was shared uh, with me by a woman in our community who's, who's lovely. Um, and this book is called Buddhist Fasting Practice. The oh, Nayungin? Nayungin? Method of Thousand Armed Shen Rezig. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I know I butchered that. I apologize. I should have practiced this beforehand. <laughs> um, but this is a Tibetan Buddhist practice. Uh, Nayung Nay, 
Nayunye, I think is how it's pronounced, um, that has been getting increased attention in Buddhist centers across North America. And participants say that the practice purifies them both physically and spiritually. There's some really interesting stories in this one um, of a Buddhist nun who lived many years ago um, and who fasted but incredibly devoutly um, as part of her path to enlightenment. And as she was undergoing that, it also um, transformed her leprosy. And so really, really cool, interesting stories from the Buddhist tradition. Um, and she's apparently one of the only, or one of very few, maybe the only um, Buddhist nun who founded her own branch of the religion. So for my feminists out there, <laughs> it's a pretty cool story. Um, a comprehensive guide to fasting in Islam in the month of Ramadan is one of the kind of most robust books I could find on the fasting tradition in Islam. Um, and it says the book seeks to explore the divine institution of fasting in Islam by, by providing comprehensive information on its place in the Islamic doctrine and on the month of Ramadan in which fasting is observed. Major topics include fasting in Islam other, and other faiths, merits and benefits of fasting, types of fasts, uh, charity in Ramadan, fasting and health. Fasting in Islam is, well, is a well-written introduction book that lays the base foundation, sorry, that lays, uh, that lays down the basics of fasting as practiced by Muslims. There we go. Ooh. Um, then feasting and fasting, the history of ethics of Jewish food. This is actually one I have not had a chance to read yet, um, but I'm looking forward to reading. And it's one of the few books I could find on the Jewish faith and fasting. Um, there was another book, kind of funny story. There was another book called, I believe it's called Feasting and Fasting in Judaism. Um, I'll, I'll get the exact title and come back with it. But um, it was, so interesting because there was a lot about feasting and nothing about fasting in that book. They mentioned fasting, I think, three times, and each time it was in reference to Islam and Ramadan, not into uh, fasting in the in the Jewish faith. And then I think they might have mentioned it like once in reference to Yom Kippur, and that was it. And I found that just so funny because it was in the title of the book. So I did try to read a book on Jewish fasting. I just anyway. <laughs> um, but this one says, uh, let's see, I'm trying to find the part kind of in this publisher, publisher summary that talks specifically about fasting. Um, yeah, again, it focuses a lot on the food. Um, yeah and kind of more about kosher. Um, but anyway, should be an interesting one. I'm definitely looking forward to reading it. Um, yeah. It says, feasting and fasting provides a resource for anyone who hungers to understand how food and religion intersect. Maybe this is the one I read. I'll have to go back and <laughs> double check. It's a different cover. Um, so then when we start getting into specific benefits of fasting, um, there are some interesting ones. So let's see, if you are interested in aging and longevity, there are a few really good books in this space. Um, Lifespan by David Sinclair is one, though lately he's been getting some flack um, for his involvement in a company um, and kind of some of the complications that uh, have arisen from that. So anyway, I'm not super up on all of the controversy surrounding it. So definitely, you know, do your own research. But he does put together a pretty um, powerful book looking at why we age and why we don't have to. And... Get it, a lot of it gets into fasting 
and some of the effects of fasting. It also gets into gut microbiome and supplements that can be taken, um, which is, I believe, where he started to get into some trouble. Um, or just that the, my, my memory of it, and, and I'll have to go and research this more because um, I'm live and on the spot, but um, is that it had something to do with how effective the uh, intervention was and that maybe it wasn't living up to its initial hype, something along those lines. A um, few quotes from this book. Thanks to an increasingly sedentary lifestyle and abundance of sugars and carbohydrates, on every supermarket shelf around the globe, high blood sugar is causing premature, the premature deaths of 3.8 million people a year. Um, and he also says, I believe that aging is a disease. I believe it is treatable. I believe that we can treat it within our lifetimes. And in doing so, I believe everything we know about human health will be fundamentally changed. You know, it's funny because when he says that high blood pressure is causing premature death of 3.8 million people a year, it's like, yeah, but you think about, I mean, seven of the top 10 killers are um, basically uh, chronic conditions that are influenced by what we eat. And blood pressure is not top of that list. Top of that list is heart disease um, and related, you know, heart related things and cancer. Those are the two big whammies. Those alone make up more than 40% of what kill people in our, in our modern era. And so I think it's just really interesting that he focuses on that one. But anyway, um, maybe that was just the particular quote. Then for other medical conditions, like talk about diabetes makes the top 10 list. And I think it's like a little further down on the list, maybe number seven or something. But um, it's certainly a rising one. And um, probably the best book on fasting for diabetes is, again, from Dr. Jason Fung, The Diabetes Code. And, you know, I wouldn't promote him again if it weren't for the fact that he really knows the space and he is probably one of the leading, it, no, he's got to be the leading clinician really looking at fasting as a way to reverse um, type 2 diabetes and give people back a normal, a normal life. And so, and he, you know, as a clinician who actually works with patients, he's a nephrologist, um, I have tremendous respect for him coming out and, and really shedding light on all of this. And so, he, a couple quotes from his book here. Um, the key to the proper treatment of type 2 diabetes is to get rid of the excess sugar, not just move it around the body. The problem is both too much glucose and too much insulin. And another quote, fasting is the simplest and surest method to force your body to burn sugar. Fantastic one. He also does a deep dive on obesity in the obesity code. So if you're specifically interested in um, better understanding that um, condition and, and how it arises, um, I think one of the most interesting things that I found in that book was just how long it takes for our bodies to really start to um, become obese and insulin resistant, that it doesn't just happen, you know, you don't eat one Twinkie and it causes this problem. It is really a, um, a problem that builds over years and decades and generations. And the generations part is really scary. Um, you know, the fact that we are now seeing babies born that are obese um, and that they basically, you know, are going to have to be kind of, or are born, you know, um, with diabetes. I mean, things like that are just, I think, so concerning um, and, and really speak to why we need to figure out how to, how to help people and, and reverse this trend because um, I just think it's so heartbreaking that a, a kid is already born with a condition that's going to, um, you know, a, a preventable condition that is going to, um, you know, hurt their, hurt their lifespan um, right out of the gate. So, um, all right, let's see. A couple quotes from this book that I think are really good. Once we understand that obesity is a hormone imbalance, we can begin to treat it. If we believe that excess calories cause obesity, then the treatment is to reduce calories, but this method has been a complete failure. However, if too much insulin causes obesity, then it becomes clear what we need to do. 
lower insulin levels. And I think this so speaks to how um, historically the medical community has just been so harsh on people saying that, you know, things like that, um, you know, it's just, it, it's diet and lifestyle. Like you have to just, you just have to, you know, work harder at it. Like just eat less and exercise more and like completely failing to understand the complexity of this issue, the fact that it relates to hormones and even more than, you know, it, it, hormones are a huge piece of it, but even beyond hormones, also just the relationship that like our gut health has in all of this, the type of calories that we're getting, how much that matters. I mean, I think that we've done such, you know, the, um, in America, both public health and the medical community have really just done such a disservice to patients. And the fact that um, people are, uh, you know, seen as having some type of moral failing if they are obese or are struggling with their weight or have some of these conditions when they were being told all the wrong things by the so-called experts. Like, I think it's just so heartbreaking. And I think we really have to get the shame and the guilt and the um, judgment out of treating these conditions because they are medical conditions that frankly our modern lifestyle created um you know our, our genes are uh, you know designed to try and help us survive times of famine not times of drive-through restaurants with supersized sugary beverages and so yeah there's just so much that i think needs to be um, re-examined in all of this but anyway um that's a great quote from that book another one uh, let's see. The healthy snack is one of the greatest weight loss deceptions. The myth that grazing is healthy has attained legendary status. If we were meant to graze, we would be cows. Grazing is the direct opposite of virtually all food traditions. Even as recently as 1960, most people still ate just three meals a day. Constant stimulation of insulin eventually leads to insulin resistance. Yeah, good, good stuff in there. Um, another book, kind of a curveball, but I'm going to share The Great Cholesterol Myth, Why Lowering Your Cholesterol Won't Prevent Heart Disease, and The Statin-Free Plan That Will. Um, this one is not as much about fasting, but it definitely comes up in the fasting community a lot. And I think that's in part because it's another one of these where modern medical wisdom has really let a lot of people down um, and has been prescribing statins left and right and statins do a really great job of kind of lowering what they say they're going to lower and doing a really bad job of actually preventing the um you know heart attacks and things that um you know heart disease that people are actually trying to avoid by taking those medications so it's like one of those things where you're lowering the metric and you think you're doing well, but really it's not actually addressing the root cause of the problem at all. So I think that's another interesting one um, to explore for sure. And then um, if you're interested in PCOS, the PCOS plan is a great one. Um, so I'm just going through for those who are joining. Hi, it's good to um, see so many of you joining. Oh, and I see, okay, question in chat, so I will get to that. I'm just going through some of my absolute favorite fasting books um, because I've been compiling them lately and just wanted to share with you some of the best of what's out there because there are so many different fasting books hitting the market now. You know, since um, prior to about 2015, there really were not many modern fasting books out there at all. And then in the last less than 10 years, it has just been exploding. And now there's over 10,000 intermittent fasting books on Amazon for sale. And they are not all of equal quality, um, but fasting, and I talked a little bit at the beginning about fasting being a trend versus a fad, and fasting is absolutely a trend. This is something where the science backs us up, it is incredible for our health, and when you actually look at the scientific literature, the research on this, this is not like a cabbage soup diet thing. This is not something that's gonna like come into popularity, Beanie Baby style, and then flame out. Um, this is definitely a trend that is going to, to be here to stay. Um, and it just, the question is just how quickly it's going to really take on, take off because, you know, in the case of smoking, we knew smoking was bad for us decades ago. Um, and it took 40 years for it to become not even standard of care, but mainstream medical knowledge. 
in the case of fasting, I think that process is happening right now. And a lot of people are learning about it themselves, experimenting with it on their own bodies and realizing how incredibly game changing this is. And so I think that, um, you know, the more you get high quality, good information about fasting and we support those authors that are clinicians, that are researchers that have really done their homework, um, the better I think it is. So the question came up, what fasting book really inspired me? Um, so, oh gosh, there's so many that have inspired me. Um, but I think probably initially the first one that really inspired me, and this is a curveball. I bet nobody will expect this, um, but was the potato fast. So there's a book called the potato fast that I don't necessarily recommend. I have a lot of love for, <laughs> but I would not recommend as a guide to fasting or intermittent fasting. Um, because it's not a pure fast, but what they recommend or, or what they um, uh, have people try is eating nothing but plain boiled potatoes for like a week or a month or whatever time period. And I tried it for a week because I was just so curious about this. And this is just as I was getting into fasting when this is back in 2015 when there are no other books out on fasting. Um, and. Yeah, it's just like when you all you can eat all day is boiled plain potatoes, Yukon gold, but still um, with a little bit of salt, you realize that you're actually very rarely hungry. You're very often craving things. You're very often um, interested in what somebody else is eating and wanting that, but you are very, very rarely actually hungry for food. And noticing that I was only eating like maybe a potato to a potato and a half that was like this big each day that I was doing this, I was like, this is bizarre. Like I eat so much more food than this normally, but really I'm doing it because it's junk food or it's um, something that tastes really good or, you know, I'm not doing it because I'm actually hungry. And I think it was just so insanely eye-opening to see that firsthand. And so that book actually inspired me down this whole path of better understanding fasting, um, what our bodies actually need, understanding the difference between hunger and cravings, which I think is so, um, you know, just so wild. Like so, uh, it's just so amazing to me that we, that it's so intertwined and we don't better understand that. You know, I thought I knew when I was hungry. Like you think you know when you're hungry since you're a little kid. But you really start to question that when you begin fasting and you start to realize that, holy cow, I'm actually not hungry. I am smelling something that smells delicious and now I want that. Now my you know stomach acid is sort of ramping up and my body's saying, yeah, 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 let's go get that. But that's not really true ghrelin induced hunger. That's environmentally induced hunger, right? Like if I wasn't by, walking by that delicious smelling kitchen, I wouldn't be tempted. And I think when you start to realize that, or like, you know, we have a number of uh, members that have talked about like, when they get home at 5 p.m., their first move was always to open the fridge, grab a snack, and hit the couch. And when you start fasting and you can't do that, you realize like, oh my gosh, this is such a, this has so much power over me, this habit. And I don't want it to, I wanna fight that back, you know, fight that off, um, get my freedom back. And yeah, it's just, I think it's really fascinating to watch this stuff. So um, let's see, I'll tell you about a few more books. Keep asking questions though, I'm happy to answer them. Um, another one that I'm gonna share just for those, I don't know that this is really a um, book that applies to a lot of people, but if you are struggling or know anybody that's struggling with PCOS, um, which being a woman in my late 30s, um, I have lots of friends that are in this camp. Um, the PCOS Diet is a book written by, um, oh wait, this is a different one. PCOS Plan is the one that I'm thinking of. Um, PCOS Plan is written by uh, Nadia, and I'm blanking on her last name, and Dr. Jason Fung. And it specifically goes deep on the um, kind of relationship between insulin and PCOS and women's hormones and how um, insulin resistance can cause PCOS. And so it's really interesting or how it's heavily correlated with, put it that way. 
Um, and if you start reversing insulin resistance, um, you can reverse the symptoms of PCOS in many of these women. So I think that is a super helpful one to people who are struggling with that. Um, also, let's see, the case against sugar is a Gary Tobes one that I think does a nice job of explaining why sugar is so bad for us and how it has become so ubiquitous in our foods and specifically how um, uh, the sugar industry is taking a lot of the same playbook that the tobacco industry used, but doing it better. And I think it's a really sort of scary, enlightening book um, that makes you definitely rethink how you how you see sugar for sure. And it's a one sided book, no question about it. He is presenting his like essentially as if he was a lawyer going up against the sugar you know industry or or trying to appeal to the American people. Um, he's anti-sugar. And then you can imagine there's a lawyer that's pro-sugar, though. I don't know how much of an argument they could really have other than it appears in nature, but always with fiber, which it doesn't in our modern food supply. And that uh, in moderation, it's not so bad, but we're not eating it in moder moderation in our society at all anymore. Um, so it's a good one. Um, and I'll read you a few quotes from his. So no such ambiguity existed about sugar consumption. We now eat in two weeks the amount of sugar that our ancestors ate of 200, the amount of sugar our ancestors of 200 years ago ate in a whole year. As the University of London nutritionist, John Yudkin wrote in 1963 of the situation in England, sugar provides about 20% of our total intake of calories and nearly half of our carbohydrate. Um, John Yudkin also wrote an amazing book that I have on this list, Pure White and Deadly. Um, and as, as Tobe states in this, he wrote it back in 1963, raising the alarm bells on sugar back then, before we started seeing the epidemics of obesity and type 2 diabetes, when they were just sort of starting to rise, they about 10 years into their, their initial rise. So um, his is phenomenal, and it doesn't pull any punches. Um, when I read that, I immediately stopped sugar. <laughs> so if you need a little motivation to quit sugar, just keep reading that book. Um, and another quote from Tobes, sugar has become an ingredient avoidable in prepared, un, uh, I think you should say, yeah. Sugar has become an ingredient avoidable in prepared and packaged foods only by um, concerted and determined effort effectively ubiquitous. Not just the obvious sweet foods, candy bars, sugar, ice creams, chocolate, sodas, sports uh, drinks, and energy drinks, sweetened iced teas, jams, jellies, breakfast cereals, both cold and hot, but also in peanut butter, salad dressings, ketchup, barbecue sauces, canned soups, cold cuts, luncheon meats, bacon, hot dogs, pretzels, chips, roasted peanuts, spaghetti sauces, canned tomatoes, and breads. From the 1980s onward, manufacturers of products advertised as uniquely healthy because they were low in fat, not to mention gluten-free, no MSG, no, and zero grams of trans fats per serving, took replacing these fat choice uh, calories with sugar to make them equally palatable and often disguised the sugar under one or more of the 50 plus names by which fructose glucose combinations of sugar and high fructose corn syrup might be found. Fat was removed from candy bars, sugar was added, or at least kept, so that they became health food bars. Fat was removed from yogurts and sugars added, and these became heart healthy snacks, breakfasts, and lunches. Um, I just think his work is so good and so interesting. Um, and you know, the case against sugar, I think is pretty clear, <laughs> pretty clear cut in terms of the effects of it on our bodies. I mean, sugar is just not something we were meant to eat in its refined process form, um, or in the kind of quantities that we, and in the kind of quantities that we are eating today. 
Um, Fat Chance is another book that kind of talks about sugar and processed foods and obesity and disease. Um, so not necessarily about fasting, but a lot about the reason why we now need to fast and uh, why fasting is so effective. Um, and it's written by Dr. Robert Lustig, who if you're not familiar with, is fantastic. He did a 90 minute YouTube video on sugar called The Bitter Truth that has been viewed over two million times now. Um, and he's, you know, just done some amazing things. I believe he is a, I'm trying to see if it lists it here. Um, he is a child uh, endocrinologist. So he sees a lot of obese children. And this has really driven his passion to help educate the public on how dangerous um, sugar and processed foods are, that they're not just like fun treats to enjoy on a regular basis. Um, yeah, here's two quotes from his book. So, the obesity pandemic is due to our altered biochemistry, which is a result of our altered environment. And the real problem is not losing the weight, but keeping it off for any meaningful length of time. Numerous sources show that almost every lifestyle intervention works for the first three to six months, but then the weight comes rolling back on. So yeah, so he has a really great one. Um, I'll do one more. And if you're joining, um, I see several of you in uh, the live. Welcome. It's great to have you joining us. Um, let me know if you're fasting. I'm so curious to hear who's actively fasting. And um, if there's any questions you have, I will take one right at the end. Um, but I will give you one more book while you're adding those into chat because of the lag. It takes a little bit. Um, so the last one, let's see, oh man, it's so hard to pick just one. All right, I'll do one that's kind of on behavior change because um, I think that this is important too. The Craving Mind by Judson Brewer is a great book. Um, so he uh, is a MD, PhD, I believe, neuroscientist, I want to say. I should double check that. Um, and he looks at how to break addiction and habits um, that aren't serving us. And so the craving mind is from cigarettes to smartphones to love, why we get hooked and how we can break bad habits. And in this book, he talks about sort of this loop um, that was addressed in like the power of habit, but it, he goes so much deeper on it, so much more into the science and into mindfulness and how to change these behaviors. Um, and I'll read you a few quotes from it, but I, I think that this is a really good one. Um, Until we define happiness for ourselves, clearly seeing the difference between excitement and joy, for example, our habits will likely not change we will keep returning to the fruit of our desires. And so one of the concepts that he really talks a lot about is dopamine versus um, serotonin. So dopamine is the chemical that makes us go seek things, want things, have that like itch to go get it. And serotonin is our actual happiness chemical. And we often confuse the two. And we think that, oh, we need to go get this because we it's gonna make us happy. If you've ever had that experience of like, oh, I'm gonna go get this particular food. I won't mention it because I know a lot of you are probably fasting. And then you start eating it and you just keep wanting more. That having it isn't making you happy the way you thought it was. It's just making you crave more. That is dopamine in action. Serotonin is the one that makes you feel good, like content, joy, love, happiness. like. When you see a loved one that you haven't seen in a long time, that is serotonin in action. And there's a big difference, but our society and in our own brains, we confuse the two. And by confusing the two, and potentially marketers do it on purpose, um, we are mistakenly thinking that by craving these things and fulfilling this craving, we're gonna make ourselves happy, and we really don't. That's just not the reality of it. Um, another quote from him, the self itself is, isn't a problem since remembering who we are when we wake up each morning is very helpful. 
Instead, the problem is the extent to which we get caught up in the drama of our lives and take it personally when something happens to us, good or bad. So, all right, that is my last recommendation for today. We've got, oh my gosh, I've got so many more too, but um, some of the really good ones. And let me switch back to the live stream here and just see. Um, cool, okay. So I'm gonna put up our end screen. No questions, come on guys. All right, next time I expect you to come with questions. We'll be doing our next live stream on Monday. Um, so bring your questions then, same time, same place. Um, though actually a different link, but you'll see it when you log in. Um, and then let me put up here our end screen. I don't remember this time. Doop, doop, doop. Okay, so you will have all of our, I hope that's working. Let's see. You'll have all the info on how to reach us. So, um, fasting from that should say thefastingflamingo.com. We gotta fix that. Sorry, it's thefastingflamingo.com. Um, Instagram is at thefastingflamingo. YouTube is thefastingflamingo. Everything's thefastingflamingo, like the logo. Um, and then every uh, Monday and Friday right now, we're trying these live streams and doing these lunch-free lunch hours. And so if you like it, please keep joining because I'm only going to do them if people turn up. So you got to turn up to watch and ideally ask questions because they'll be much more interesting if uh, if you keep asking questions. But I'm happy to share with you all the different things that I've learned about fasting through my now, what is it, seven years personally fasting and my last two and a half years um, leading a support group for fasters and talking to thousands of different fasters um, plus reading basically every book I shared with you today on the subject. So a lot of time spent on fasting um, and I want you to benefit from my knowledge. I really wanna help people learn about fasting, um, master it, get really comfortable with it so that you can get all the benefits that it has to offer. Um, it's just too good for our health not to be regularly fasting. So thank you so much for watching this. Um, it's wonderful to have you joining. And yes, next time, be chattier. <laughs> I want to hear from you. Um, but it's good to see so many of you in the, in the um, group. And I will um, see you on Monday. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. I hope you guys are doing fun things. Take care and happy fasting.